what is up you so welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel now welcome back go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed unless of course you know your taste level is lacking and if that's the case then that's okay you guys so the thing is about a year ago, I made up a long list of all the cases I wanted to cover, right? And I've been working off of that list since. Blue distracted me right here, but I was trying to say that I posted on Instagram asking what cases do you guys want to see? So for the next couple of weeks and possibly months, because I got a lot of suggestions, that is the list that I'll be pulling cases from. Beginning with today's video, it was suggested to me by Brielle. Girl, I don't want to butcher your last name. I think it's Rizzotti. We just going to leave it there because that might be wrong. And, and anything else I say is just going to be wronger, potentially. So, yeah. But I do love your name because the thing is, if you don't know, Violet, my niece, her middle name, y'all, is Brielle, which is my first and middle name put together. Brittany Michelle, Brielle. Love that. And as you can see, she suggested to me the case of Joshua Phillips. And I had never heard of this case. When I reposted her response, a lot of y'all were like, girl, you haven't heard of that? Like, it's really wild. It's really crazy. You should do it. And so I went to check it out. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, this is a lot. And y'all know typically I do not do child cases. I, I, I hung that hat up a long time ago. But this case is kind of different because it's not the typical adult, like, preying on a child. It is a crime that happened between two children. And I feel like it could potentially serve as a cautionary tale because the thing is, I already am convinced that I'll be like one of those overprotective, like stressed out parents. Like honestly, I don't even understand how y'all let y'all's kids walk out the door in the morning and go like to school, like just go out into the world. Like what if something happens? This case unlocked a new fear for me. We typically look for the boogeyman or the creepy looking, you know, adult as a potential predator. And rarely do we look at their little peers as possible predators outside of like maybe being a bad influence or, you know, trying to hunch and play house. It definitely gave me a new and different perspective and maybe it'll give somebody else that same perspective and maybe it'll make a difference. I don't know. Maybe it'll be a cautionary tale to someone. Anywho, with all that being said and without further delay, let's just get into the case. Joshua Phillips was born March 17th of 1984, making him Pisces. I made that note in the beginning of my research, and I am actually very shocked and appalled that he is a Pisces. Interesting. He was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and his family dynamic from birth was a very toxic one. Very dysfunctional, with his father, Stephen, being a very alcohol and drug dependent individual who would also become very violent toward Joshua and his mother, Melissa. Now the two of them live in the house with Steve terrified of him. They live in constant fear, walking on eggshells, trying to be careful not to trigger an emotional response from Steve. As much as they try to avoid triggering Steve and setting him off, it is extremely difficult, especially for his son, Joshua, whom he's imposed a number of very strict rules upon. One of which being that when he is away from the house, under no circumstance is Joshua allowed to have company, nor is he allowed to go outside and play with the other children. He is just to stay inside the home and find a way to entertain himself until, of course, he comes home. Steve really didn't even care for the presence of other children in the home when he was there and he did not even like them playing right outside of his house like in the yard and according to his wife Melissa he especially dislikes the presence of little girls and this she knows but she never knows why. Nonetheless to keep as much peace as possible within the Phillips household Joshua and Melissa play by these rules and they ask very few questions if any at all. Now, those who knew Joshua as a child describe him as both friendly and very quiet. And according to a former teacher of his, he was a very popular kid. He was well liked. He was funny. He was silly, but he did not stand out. Like he was not the type of child that would just catch your eye. Very basic. In the early 90s, the Phillips family relocates to Jacksonville, Florida, and they move into a house directly across the street from another family, the Clifton family. 
The Cliftons have two daughters, eight-year-old Maddie and 11-year-old Jessie. Both little girls are very pretty, so it's not long before Joshua develops a little crush on Jesse, who's closer to his age. Joshua often plays with the two of them, which the Cliftons don't mind at all, at least not at first. It is not until they find out that he has been making sexual comments toward their children that they take issue with how much time he's spending with them. And in addition to that, and also unbeknownst to the Cliftons, Joshua has somehow gotten his little hands on a photo of Jesse, which he's taped to the back of his headboard. At this point, they're not so comfortable with this little kid from across the street, and rightfully so. Due to his parents' work schedule, Joshua is oftentimes left home alone, and he typically spends that time, of course, inside the house because he is not allowed to go outside and play. A lot of that time, he spends surfing the internet. Now, around this time, the Cliftons also noticed some very strange but seemingly unrelated things going on with their home. They take notice of pry marks on the outside of of their daughter's bedroom window. Very obvious attempts made by someone to gain access to their home, either while they are sleeping or while they are away. And not long after they take notice of these pry marks outside of the window, something terrible happens. On November 3rd, 1998, election day, Sheila Clifton returns home from voting and their youngest daughter, Maddie, bolts out of the house to go play, promising to be home before dinner. Nothing about it feels out of the ordinary. Maddie typically goes outside to play. This is nothing new. And their older daughter, Jessie, is already outside. So Sheila allows her to run off to play. About an hour to maybe an hour and a half later, their oldest daughter, Jessie, returns home. And Sheila asks her, well, where's your sister? Dinner is almost ready. And she tells her that she hadn't seen Maddie at all. Maddie was not out playing with her. So Sheila just tells her, you know, go get your sister. She promised that she'd be home by now and she's not returned. Tell her dinner is ready. And Jessie sets off to go find her little sister. But she's walking through the neighborhood and she cannot find Maddie anywhere. Jesse goes and checks all of the areas that Maddie is known to play in. She then checks with the neighborhood children that Maddie would typically play with, and none of them have seen her either. Eventually, she returns home to give her parents the bad news, which is Maddie is literally nowhere to be found. And immediately, they begin their own search, going door to door, asking people if they'd seen their daughter. At this point, the Clifton is decide to contact the police and report Maddie missing. Many of the neighbors whom they questioned about Maddie's whereabouts volunteered to assist the Cliftons in their search for their daughter, including Joshua Clifton and his parents. The group of neighbors spend the rest of the entire evening into the early hours of the morning on foot with flashlights out searching for Maddie Clifton. Now, by interviewing a couple of Maddie's friends from the neighborhood, detectives find out that she did go join the group of neighborhood kids down the street to play. She'd actually been out there playing baseball with them and she went home to collect more balls. But when she didn't return to continue to play with them, they just assumed that she changed her mind and decided to stay inside the house for the rest of the evening and didn't bother to check or think anything of it. But according to her family, of course, she never came home for anything. They had not seen or heard from her since she had initially left the home to go play. That night, they don't find any evidence or clues, literally nothing that points them in the direction of the little girl or even begins to paint a picture of what could have possibly happened to her after she left from playing with the kids. The search efforts go on for an additional six days with them not finding a shred of evidence or a single clue. And over a thousand people come out to volunteer their time to help search for Maddie as the news of her disappearance spreads over the Jacksonville and surrounding areas. Even the National Guard troops are enlisted to come out and walk through the sewer system for signs of this missing girl and still nothing. On the morning of the seventh day, Mrs. Phillips walks into Joshua's room to clean it up a little bit. Now, she had noticed a little foul stench coming from his room. And she figured, you know, little boys can be nasty and dirty. Maybe, maybe he has some old food or some dirty socks under the bed. Something that is causing this little stench to leak out into her hallway. Almost immediately, she notices a huge wet spot on the floor near the foot of his bed. 
And because Joshua has a water bed, she figures that this makes sense. The bed must be leaking onto the carpet and must have caused, you know, that little, the little spot to begin to mildew. And she gets down onto the floor to pull apart the baseboard and check underneath his bed for the leak. But instead, she makes a horrific discovery. There's a small foot underneath his bed. Once she sees that, she runs out of her son's room, out of the house completely, because there is still a lot of press and police and a whole media circus across the street surrounding Maddie's disappearance. So she dashes across the street, grabs one of the police officers, and leads them back to her son's room. Now at this point, she cannot bear to go back inside the room at all. She just points them in the direction of his bed for them to take a look and see for themselves. And sure enough, eight-year-old Maddie Clifton is laying underneath Joshua's bed. Now, meanwhile, across the street, the Cliftons had actually just wrapped up the taping of an interview with a national morning news program. And they had actually witnessed Melissa Phillips running across the street toward their house to grab a police officer and then returning to her home. And they had also noticed not long after that, police putting up crime scene tape around the Phillips house, believing that something may have happened to one of them. But before they can check on their neighbors or find out, you know, what's going on with, with the Phillips, they hear a knock at their door and it is the police. The police come inside and deliver the horrible news that Maddie's remains have been found and that they had actually been found right across the street. Now, Joshua, who is in school at the time, is arrested and brought down to the police station for questioning where his parents meet him to sit by his side, completely oblivious to the horrific details that they were about to listen to. With his father sitting right by his side, Joshua goes over the horrific details of what happened on the last day that Maddie had been seen. Now, according to him, he'd been at home alone waiting on his parents to return when he hears a knock at the door, and it is Maddie. The little girl invites him outside to play baseball with her, and reluctantly, he tells her yes. Now, he also tells Maddie that he can only play outside with her for just a few minutes because his father was to do home any minute. And he, of course, is not allowed to be outside playing or have kids over at the house or even in the yard when his father is not at home. Knowing how his father would likely react, the last thing that he wanted was for Steve to pull up and see not only that he had broken a rule, but of course that there was a little girl that he was playing with. So the two of them go to Joshua's backyard to play baseball. Maddie throws the ball toward him. He hits the ball and then the ball hits her in the head, striking her near her eye and it causes her to bleed. And she begins to cry, of course, because she's only eight. Like she's, she's a little kid. At this point, Joshua begins to freak out. He takes her into the house because she's making a whole lot of noise. He wants to just calm her down, diffuse the situation, stop the bleeding if he can, and just try to clean up the situation because, of course, his parents are on the way. He attempts to calm young Maddie down, but she continues to sob. And the fear of his father returning home literally any minute is basically what's on the forefront of his mind. Not to mention, he is also fearing the trouble that he'd be in once his father finds out that her injury is also his fault. And in that moment, in an effort to silence her, he grabs the bat and hits her several more times in the head until she is unconscious. Afterward, he pushes her underneath his bed and moments later, he hears his parents come home. He goes downstairs as if nothing had happened, interacts with them for a while, and then he returns back to his bedroom. He sits on his bed and then he hears like these faint moans. And he can also feel her moving slightly underneath the mattress. When he lifts it up, he finds that she is still very much alive. He goes and gets a pocket knife, pulls up the mattress and jams it into her chest seven times and then cuts her throat. About an hour after this, he hears a knock at the door 
and it is Maddie's parents asking his parents, have they seen her? They of course say no, they ask him, he says no. And the Cliftons let the Phillips know like, our daughter is literally missing at this point. We can't find her anywhere. And at that point, they all, Joshua included, volunteered to help them go out and look for her. After the search, Joshua returns home with a missing poster of young Maddie tapes it to his mirror, lays down on the waterbed that is literally right above her and goes to sleep as if nothing had happened. For the next six days, he sleeps on this bed with Maddie decomposing right underneath him, telling himself that it wasn't real and that it literally just never happened. After news of his confession spread amongst the neighborhood, people were shocked. People that knew him personally because they did not ever think that he was capable of something like this. The entire neighborhood was in disbelief. No one that knew Josh would have even believed or speculated that he would be capable of doing something like this. He was not a violent child. He was not a bad child. He wasn't given any of the things that the kids like Mary Bell give. And his parents, even though sitting right by his side, listening to him go over the details, are completely shocked and in a state of disbelief. They have never seen any violent tendencies from him, anything at all that would have made them suspect that he was capable of doing something like this. And investigators were in disbelief as well because they had actually searched the Phillips house three times during their investigation and search for Maddie. A homicide detective had even spoken to Joshua as Joshua sat on the waterbed. And the detective noticed this slight stench in his room, but he attributed that smell to three birds that he had as pets inside the home. Now, because of the, the local police's incompetence, the FBI becomes involved because, you know, girl, y'all have really fucked this up at this point move just move and some of the things that they find and uncover make this case a bit more strange a search of joshua's computer shows that he had been looking at violent porn with a p on the family's computer literally minutes before maddie had come knocking on the door it is their belief that this piece of evidence or this fact offers some sort of an explanation as to what happened. They believe that it's quite possible that some of these images that he had been looking at right before she had come and knocked on the door had triggered him to act on his curiosity and his interest in this type of thing. They even question whether or not his story is true at this point. Did he really go outside and play with her for a while? Had things actually transpired the way that he said that they had? Or did he just invite her inside with a more sinister plan in mind? And then at some point, did he become afraid that she would tell on him, that he would get in trouble for what he had done to her? So he felt like he had no other choice but to, you know, neutralize the threat. Especially paired with the fact that Maddie was found undressed from the waist down. Now, his explanation for this was when she had begun crying in the backyard, he had to drag her inside. And with dragging her across the yard and up the stairs, the bottom of all of her clothes and everything came off. Now, the medical examiner did not know any obvious signs of trauma to her private areas, nor was there any dirt or debris or anything that showed any signs of her being dragged across the yard. And when they searched the backyard for the blood from when she got hit, there was none. Now, the Cliftons, Maddie's parents, do believe that the material he was looking at played a role in what happened that day and said that had he not had access to those materials, then Maddie would still be here. Now, Joshua's father, Stephen Phillips, had the audacity to nastily snap back at that comment and say, had she not come over knocking on his door, none of this would have happened. The audacity of this man to even say that, like... How dare you? Completely disgusted and placing the blame on this poor child and not your own and partly yourself. Now Joshua, of course, is detained pending his trial date. And in the meantime, neither of the families plan to move from the area. Neither one of them wants to give up their house. Now, the Cliftons, they didn't want to move because although it was extremely painful for them to continue to live directly across the street from 
the house that you know that it had happened at they felt like it would be equally painful to give up the home that they had raised her in that served as the arena for most of their memories that they shared with their daughter and so they didn't just want to leave her house behind and the phillips probably refused to move because steve is an asshole because why wouldn't you move so they continue to live directly across the street from each other but they don't have any any contact or direct dealings with each other child better than me the way I would have tried to tiptoe into their house in the middle of the night if I was a Clifton. Now, 14-year-old Joshua is tried as an adult for murder in the first degree, which his family felt was unfair and excessive. And with how much media attention the case had received, they had no choice but to relocate the trial to a completely different county in an effort to give him a fair trial. And during his trial, his lawyer does not call upon a single witness to the stand. Literally no one, no character witnesses, nothing on Joshua's behalf. Instead of establishing Joshua's character, he said that he wanted to base his defense heavily on the idea that this was not a premeditated act, but instead an act that had begun innocently enough as an accident and had spiraled through panic and borderline mania and madness, which was of course brought on by the abuse that he had suffered at the hands of his father. Joshua's lawyer actually never even questioned him about what had happened on that day. And in the visits that he made to Joshua in prison that they were supposed to spend prepping for the trial, he actually just spent the visits playing chess with the young boy the entire time and literally not even discussing anything about the case which I find to be extremely weird. And Joshua's mother, Melissa, she found it to be weird too. But when she brings this up to Stephen, her husband, Steve insisted on allowing the lawyer to proceed with the case with whatever strategy he pleased and saw fit. I don't know if the lawyer was a public defender and Steve was like, look, we don't have no money. We're just going to let him do his thing or what? But Steve decides that they're going to let the lawyer do whatever and not interfere or get him a new, better lawyer. Another strange decision that the lawyer made was to keep the boy off the stand. He did not want Joshua to get on the stand and say anything on his own behalf. He did not want Joshua to get on the stand and retell the story or just say anything. He just wanted the young boy to sit there quietly in the courtroom and listen to everyone else. And because Joshua did not speak during his trial, a lot of the publications and media outlets took this as him not being remorseful. They made headlines about him not being sorry, about him not apologizing to the family. And that, of course, did not look good on his behalf, which, I mean, he wasn't looking good in the first place, but you know, not having remorse just makes it even worse. The trial begins on July 6th of 1999 and lasts just two days. And the shortness of the trial has a lot to do with the lackadaisical approach by the defense and him basically not having much of a strategy at all. With his client not taking the stand and them not having any witnesses that he wanted to call on, it wasn't really a need for it to be a long drawn out trial. Now he didn't just stand there idling the entire time in court. He does attempt to introduce scans from a neurologist showing bilateral lesions on the frontal lobe of Joshua's brain, which are associated with panic and impaired judgment. And the prosecution, they wanted to introduce the evidence showing what Joshua was looking at on that computer moments before Maddie had shown up there. But the judge on the case rules both pieces of evidence as inadmissible to court for whatever reason. So the jury never hears either one of those arguments. They take just over two hours to deliberate and find Joshua guilty. Joshua is then sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole ever. He is also sent to an adult prison, not a little juvenile detention center. He is sitting there with the big boys because he committed a big boy crime. And the only reason that he escaped the death penalty is the fact that he was under the age of 16. That was his only saving grace. Now, slightly unrelated, but kind of related. I felt like it was something that you probably want to know. Joshua's father, Stephen Phillips, he actually tragically dies in a car accident the next year, in the year 2000. But his mother, Melissa, continued to stick by her son's side. And with her help and support, Joshua appeals his conviction 
when that didn't work, Melissa petitioned for her son to be granted a new trial, citing unfair treatment and his age not being considered during sentencing. She felt that although what he did was a very heinous, horrible crime, they should have considered the fact that he was just a kid, like just a child, and not require him to spend the remainder of his natural life paying for a crime that he committed at 14. And two of the officials that were actually responsible for him getting the life without parole sentence came forward and admitted to having second thoughts about giving life without the possibility of parole to a 14 year old. And even the prosecutor from the case later said that she regretted not offering Joshua a second degree plea, which would have given the judge more discretion in his sentencing and, of course, allowed him to avoid going to jail for life. Now, all of this, of course, is in Joshua's favor. And then, in 2012, the Supreme Court rules that sentencing juveniles to life in prison without the possibility of parole is unconstitutional. So with all of this, in September 2016, his legal team is successful in appealing to the court for a new sentencing hearing, which took place in 2017. And Ms. Sheila Clifton, Maddie's mother, showed up to that sentence hearing to request his sentence be upheld and to remind them of the horrific actions that he displayed that day. The gruesome acts that he had committed against her eight-year-old child who had simply shown up there and innocently asked him to come outside to play baseball. And not only that, the many opportunities that he had to make a different choice that would result in her life being saved but him ultimately deciding to end it instead. At the conclusion of this hearing, he is re-sentenced to life in prison. However, the possibility of a lighter sentence will be reviewed again in 2023, which is next year. Based on his demonstrated maturity and rehabilitation, they will decide whether or not he is eligible for a lighter sentence. Now here's where I sit with this. If it was in fact 100% an accident exactly how he had described it, I could understand his mother's concern for him having a child brain and just making a horrible series. No, because he still pulled that mattress up and did what he did. Leave him in there. I don't even believe his story, honestly. I don't. I don't think we know what happened to her. I don't believe that what he said happened. Nothing and the evidence supports his story as far as how she ended up in his bedroom. I really think he was looking at them little images, feeling the type of way. He had some little dark desires. And unfortunately, it was just a horrible time for her to come knocking on that door. And it presented him the opportunity to exercise some of his curiosities. And in the end, he didn't know what else to do with her. So he put her under his bed. And the little motherfucker is dangerous and deserves to be in jail. Forever. Anywho, Blue has begun to snore in the background. Okay, he is starting to snore in the near distance. So I'm gonna wrap up the video here because it is actually over. Thank you, Brielle, once again for your suggestion. Next week I will be pulling again from the suggestions and then I'm gonna try to get y'all like an urban legend because I miss the urban legends. Thank you to all of you who responded and suggested a case. Let me know what your thoughts are about this one down below. Let's talk about it because this was some bs parents please be mindful of the fact that your child's peers could also be predators please also support the channel by giving this video a thumbs up like the video share the video with a friend or anyone for that matter we are trying to get to 200k and we are this close so subscribe if you have not as always i appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and i look forward to seeing you in the next one peace did i have any announcements i don't think i did Not y'all fighting in the background. Thank you. So, all that being said, was that Bella? He especially has an aversion. Is that a word? That's a word. Why am I question? It's, it's, it's the right word is the question. Because that sounds like, like an allergic reaction. 
Bella, quit dashing around my floor, girl. When she goes into his bed, almost, um, okay, no, not his bed. She didn't go into his bed, girl. When they'd actually seen Melissa Clifton, no, not Clifton, girl. Now she didn't put the, put the wrong mama in the wrong family. This is my wife swap. Joshua's father, Stephen, what the hell is their last name again? Is their last name again? Phillips. What the hell are they up there doing? Please support the channel by giving the video a like. I was gonna say a like sub. I could have left it a like. Why did I stop myself? <laughs>